Well, good evening and welcome to the OBI Public Talks. My name is Tom Mickelson. I'm the President and Scientific Director of the Ontario Brain Institute, also known as OBI. So we're a provincially funded non-for-profit. We try to accelerate the discovery and innovation benefiting patients in the economy. Our network is really charged with a grand challenge of improving the quality of life for the one in three Ontarians living with a brain disorder. Through a collaborative and team science approach, we promote brain research, commercialization, and care by bringing together researchers, industry, patients, and their advocates, knowing that together we can go much farther than we could ever go alone. So improvement in the quality of life can mean many things. At OBI, we're working towards building an inclusive society, especially for the neurodiverse. And it's possible to attain this goal by increased participation in research through better care options and by combining science and technology to develop tools and resources that help individuals in their everyday lives. Through neurotech, we're finding creative solutions for existing barriers so that individuals with brain disorders can live fuller lives. So tonight we bring together these unique perspectives from the brain health community and shine a light on the tactic of neurotechnology made right here in Ontario that focus on the management of anxiety and autism. This technology is one of the many promising examples that are emerging from Ontario's vibrant neurotech cluster. And our panelists are gonna give insight on how to transform a promising idea from the laboratory to life. For now, it's my pleasure to welcome the Honorable Ross Romano, who's Ontario's Minister of Colleges and Universities, to share his thoughts on the province's flourishing neurotechnology sector. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Thank you, Dr. Mickelson. I'm honored to join you all tonight to discuss the important work being done by the Ontario Brain Institute for the advancement of research and technologies in Ontario to help those living with brain disorders. Brain disorders have a significant impact on an individual's quality of life and that of their family and their caregivers. Scientists and clinicians have made significant progress to better understand and treat brain disorders. While this important work takes place, we must continue to produce innovative resources and technologies that also work to improve the quality of everyday life. I can think of no better place for collaborative research to thrive than right here in Ontario. Our province continues to be a global leader in science productivity and is home to over 800 neuroscientists, one of the highest concentrations of professionals in the world, many being graduates of our Ontario universities. Given the pressing need to discover cures for brain disorders, we must continue to prioritize collaboration across all areas of expertise to identify life-changing solutions for Ontarians and the broader community. OBI has done phenomenal work to combine various branches of knowledge to meet community needs, fostering learning healthcare systems that respond to the needs of patients and industry leaders and connects researchers and policymakers, ensures an integrated, impactful approach to health science research. The transparent, inclusive, and collaborative work being done at OBI allows us to establish sustainable partnerships across sectors and supports Ontario-made research to reach commercial markets, both domestic and international. To continue the support of medical research, every one of us has an important role to play, whether it be entrepreneurs, researchers, or the community at large. We must combine our efforts to create a system of care that produces long lasting change for all. Let us now hear from our panelists who bring their unique perspectives to take technology from a concept to the clinic and into the homes of individuals who need it most. Thank you so much, everyone. Welcome everyone. My name is Rakib Tespe. I'll be your moderator for this event. I'm sure most of you tuning in use a smartphone or a watch to make your lives more convenient, maybe help you navigate a new city or remind you to show up for a meeting or this event. Now, this public OBI talk, as mentioned, will highlight how the ubiquitous technology we use every day to convenience our lives can be paired with brain research to improve the quality of life of individuals with various neurological conditions and disorders. We refer to this type of technology as neurotechnology. And in our case, we'll be talking about a device used to monitor and manage anxiety in individuals with autism. 
I am honored to be here with a panel of incredible industry leaders and caregivers who are making the transformative power of neurotechnology a reality. So let's meet them. The speakers will introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Diane. Take it away. Oh, I think you're on mute, Diane. Hello, I'm Diane Dewing, and I am the mother of Jessica, who is a 35-year-old woman with anxiety disorder. Thank you, Diane. Angel. Hi, my name is Angel Vibert. I work with Community Living North Bay. My title is Director of Community Residential Services. Thank you. Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Palmer. I'm the CEO and founder of Awake Labs. And last but not least, Sharon. Hi, everyone. My name is Sharon Wong. I'm the Director of Commercialization at a Hall and Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. Thank you to all of our speakers for being here today. Um, now, just a reminder that throughout our chat to please send in your questions if you have them, tell us who it's directed to, uh, and please let us know where you are watching from. We would love to know your city or country. So you can send us uh, a tweet um, or an email that is up on the slide. All right, let's get started. Diane, um, I, I wanna start off by knowing more about your daughter, Jessica. Can you tell us a bit about her? What makes her happy? What is she interested in? I'm always happy to talk about Jessica. I often say that of my four children, she it was always the easiest in so many ways. So she was one of four. That means she grew up in a really lively household. Uh, lots of people, lots of actions. And I have to tell you, she is a woman who wakes up every morning with a smile. She goes to bed every night with a smile. She is busy. She's engaging. She vocalizes. She knows how to play tricks and make jokes. Really, she, she is a delight. Music is a particular love, uh, particularly rock and techno. She likes noisy toys. She loves listening in on conversations. And as a child, you know, we took her everywhere, absolutely everywhere until she was in her 20s. We went camping, we went to see fireworks, we went to concerts, museums, art galleries, and it was wonderful. The only thing we had to keep in mind was that Jessie has a rather large personal space bubble. And as long as we ensured that that was intact, she was fine. Food and food practice are major things for Jess. She loves spicy food. She also likes a variety of textures in her food and restaurants are particularly wonderful because they combine travel, food, and conversation. Now she does have challenges because Jessie's at an egocentric stage in her life. So she doesn't understand things like waiting her turn. That's something we'll be working on for a very long time, I suspect. The other thing is she assumes that if she can see and touch any food or any item, then it must be for her. Thankfully, uh, she's very active, so she's not gaining any unhealthy weight. Thank you, Diane. This, J Jessica and I both have the love of spice in common there. Um, uh, and, and so... <laughs> When, when we chatted last, um, so, you know, individuals with autism, we know from research are likely to experience anxiety. It's a, it's a common co-occurring diagnosis. Uh, but Diane, when we spoke, you, you mentioned that Jess, in Jessica's case, she didn't have much anxiety during childhood, that it became more of a salient problem during adulthood. Can you, can you tell us what anxiety looks like for Jessica and, and how it has impacted yeah. her adulthood? So somewhere around age 25, something changed, whether it's hormonal, whether it's age or whether it's genetics, who knows, but certainly anxiety disorder was became a part of her life. For Jessie, anxiety looks like running away. 
And if there is any person or thing in her way, she will barrel through, she will hit, and she will scream until she manages to make her way out of the situation. Uh, that can be really tough because during those episodes, her personal bubble actually becomes larger and larger. It, um, in fact, anyone within three to four feet of her is likely to be hit. And that, that's a real problem when she is engaging in uh, activities where she's being transported, for instance, in a van with other people. So it's not always possible to separate when an anxious moment appears. That's tough and it impacts her life. Thank you for sharing that, Diane. Um, and Angel, I, I just wanna continue on that. Um, can, can you expand on some of the barriers that care staff face in identifying and helping manage anxiety for those with autism or intellectual disabilities like Jessica who are living in a community residential service? Yes, I'd be happy to. So some of the barriers that um, support staff may face when supporting individuals who may have autism or a developmental disability is that the person may not have learned how to express what they're feeling in a form of verbal communication. Or when they're feeling the sensation of anxiety, it can overwhelm them really quickly and there's not time to um, effectively verbalize how they're feeling to ask for some help. Um, some people can't interpret what they're feeling and format that into a form of verbal communication communication to express it. And um, there's some people who don't use words to communicate and they can only show us how they're feeling by physically showing us. So it leaves support staff um, to really kind of figure out what might be happening through observations, um, observations of the person, um, what's going on at the home, is it a busy time? And to really, um, spend some time learning about the person and figuring it out. But um, if it's someone who can't verbalize how they're feeling in the moment, um, and there might be a busy routine in the home, or there's uh, something going on, and, and that staff physically misses that observation or that cue that the person is sending out as a signal for some support, then we've lost that moment of that early intervention. Hmm. Thank you so much, Angel. And, you know, for those who are unfamiliar, do you actually mind briefly describing what community rental, residential services is? Well, what does that look like? Oh, absolutely. So there's, there's, a, there's a variety of residential services, um, three in particular I'll expand on. Um, there's uh, group living homes. Um, group living homes are like homes any other in the community. From the outside, you'd really know there's no telling signs that you're looking at a group living home other than you might see a ramp for accessibility purposes purposes or a few more cars in the driveway because of the staffing teams. But, you know, it's just a home that uh, people who require 24 hour support live in. You're usually looking at about four to six people residing within the home. And inside of the home is, again, your everyday looking home environment. There might be some, um, customizations done in forms of uh, tracks for lifts on the ceiling or a designated medication area, um, but it's your regular everyday home. Those homes are supported both in home and in the community by support staff 24 hours a day. Um, we also have host family homes, which is essentially the same as a group living home. However, it's someone, a youth or an adult with a developmental disability who gets to live with a family who would provide them care and support and supervision. And we also have uh, supported independent living, which is a program designed to support individuals who live on their own in the community. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Now, Andrea, as an engineering student at UBC, you, you started to become aware of 
how anxiety and stress was impacting the autism community during an entrepreneurship course, um, similar to what we've heard from Angel and Diane. Can you tell us a bit about this, what seems like an extraordinary experience, which ultimately led to the creation of Awake Labs? Absolutely. We started um, in an entrepreneurship course that brought together engineering students and business students. And our idea was to help tackle stress and anxiety and find people who, um, you know, stress and anxiety affected them every day. And we came across some research from a scientist at Hall and Blurview uh, who was looking at anxiety for the uh, autism community. And we started talking to self advocates and therapists and parents about what it would mean if they were able to have something that notified them when the anxiety was starting to increase. And they told us that that would be life changing. Um, the course itself was only eight months um, and we continued to work closely with the community as we were building up our idea. And then we graduated and continued to get emails from the community asking when uh, this technology would be available to them. And that's really what um, drove the, the beginnings of Awake Labs was um, the, the demand and the, the constant you know, advocacy from the community to, uh, to make sure that there was a product out there that would help um, you know, the millions of people who uh, suffer from stress and anxiety um, across Canada and around the world. What an experience to have during your undergraduate degree. Um, that's incredible. Thank you. Uh, and so if we can, let's, let's talk about the technology itself. Um, can you walk us through the components of this wearable device? How does it monitor stress levels in real time? You know, how does it work in practice? Absolutely. So um, the Awake Labs technology is really a platform that has a couple of different components. There's the uh, Samsung smartwatch that measures heart rate through the sensor on the back um, that is worn by the person experiencing anxiety. It looks just like a regular watch um, and it goes on their wrist and it translates heart rate into anxiety through um, the algorithm that was developed at Hall and Blurview. So five years after you know we were students and initially reached out to that researcher at Hall and Blurview, we're actually now commercializing the research that she had developed. And then that information is sent uh, to a, a smartphone um, that uh, shows the the stress level in real time to uh, the care team or the individual themselves. And um, it notifies them if their strong emotion levels are starting to increase and they're able to act on it. And then if it's um, through an agency, you're, you're able to view all of that data and update care plans based on um, how stress and anxiety are affecting people throughout the daily lives. Um, but really what we're doing if we think about, you know, what stress is and what's causing it in these environments, um, you know, people not being able to know if they can get help when they need it or if they're in pain and they aren't able to express it um, and, uh, and and get supported or, um, you know, again, not having control of your life or who's in it and, and finding that difficult to not be able to build that trusting relationship. Those are all the things that kind of create those um, that daily stress. Um, and so what we do, we don't solve all the problems, uh, but we help caregivers and staff and and, and self advocates, um, you know, identify that there might be something else going on that they're not seeing or not thinking about. And that they if they if they take the steps to investigate it, then they can create those stronger relationships and help reduce those stress levels. Mm. Okay. And we actually already have an audience question for you, Andrea. So I'm going to just jump right into this question here. Um, Kevin asks, is there a perception that neurotechnology will be increasingly drawing from fuzzy logic? I mean, I think with, uh, so fuzzy logic is a, a, a specific form of data science or, or um, AI. And I, I think, you know, with neurotechnology, you have to uh, draw from all aspects. I don't have a, a clear answer for you about, you know, the future of the industry and, and what specifically it's drawing from. But, um, you know, we, we need to keep all the options open. And really, what's more important than the, the tool that you use is how, 
how it's being used um, by your users and what really they need. Um, because we had a lot of assumptions about what we were developing that um, that were incorrect <laughs> when we went and actually tested it. And we thought we had to have, you know, 100% accuracy on anxiety levels, but we learned from our users that it, it really was um, a, a different level and, and uh, that they had different expectations than we did. So it's really, I would say, more important about um, including your users in the design process than about um, determining what you're going to use as you're developing it. And this is a theme that we'll talk about um, throughout this panel and this chat is the iterative process that this type of technology goes through and how it can only succeed uh, with a community of people, both from research, but also the wearers and, and the folks that support them. Um, now, just a reminder, please send us your questions. You can direct your messages to your questions rather to at Ontario Brain or send an email to communications at brain institute.ca as displayed on the screen. Now, Sharon, I want to bring you into this conversation. Um, it takes a while for academic research to translate into products, policies, practice, and the environments uh, that you work in or work with academia, industry, other stakeholders, you know, they traditionally operate in silos. So great research may never translate into the hands of users who can benefit. Can you give our viewers insight into the role of commercialization and what steps are involved in making technology like Awake Labs successful in reaching their target audience? Yeah, absolutely. So um, commercialization actually plays a quite an integral role in, um, in bringing innovations that have been developed in research institutes to the market, to people uh, who would benefit from that. And um, commercialization, and it's sometimes known as technology transfer offices, uh, vary in structure, uh, depending on where uh, they're located, what institutes they're part of. But in general, they support the scientists and researchers through the various phases of commercialization. And so that can mean anything from um, evaluation and protection of uh, intellectual property like uh, patenting and uh, trademarking uh, through to looking for uh, funding and finding uh, partnerships, whether it's with community stakeholders, industry partnerships, advocates, um, all the way through to negotiating uh, licensing uh, contracts and startup uh, companies. So it's quite, um, quite the stretch uh, and breadth of uh, um, responsibilities there. And so you mentioned uh, the pitfall of working in silos and really what we're trying to do is avoid those pitfalls, right? And start working with uh, partners early, as early as possible to be able to identify uh, those opportunities, those market opportunities, and very importantly, to ensure that we are meeting the needs of, uh, of, of people and um, keeping a pulse on what those market demands are. So in the case of Awake Labs, uh, as Andreas mentioned, the technology was born out of our Autism Research Center through the work of uh, Dr. Azadeh Kushki. And um, while you know, it's, it's uh, been tested, it's uh, very uh, gone through rigorous scientific studies, um, it was really with the help of Awake Labs uh, that we were able to show the real world uh, efficacy of this technology. And Awake Labs was able to provide that feedback so that we can um, improve the technology so that it worked in real world cases. And so I think that's a very important um, part of that uh, commercialization um, pathway. Mm. And from my understanding, another important part of uh, that relationship um, and your journey was OBI having a key role in facilitating a connection between Awake Labs and Holland Bloorview. Can you expand on, you know, how that happened, why, why this was important? Absolutely. So 
OBI was instrumental in this. Uh, I mean, they really were the ones that uh, introduced uh, us to Andrea and Awake Labs, and they started that conversation uh, going. And um, without them, you know, as much as we in commercialization and technology transfer try to stay abreast of all the players in the various different uh, relevant industries, uh, it's really difficult to know everybody. And so it's really with the help of connectors like OBI uh, to help identify those potential synergies uh, that, um, that these kinds of conversations and partnerships um, can uh, come out with, come out from. Mm -hmm. And this actually ties into a question that we've just received from Varun. Um, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, and they say, I have a question um, for Sharon and Andrea. So very few Canadian neurotech startups have achieved scale and raised substantial funding. What's the missing piece for developing scaled neurotech startups in Canada? So Sharon, I'll direct that to you first. <laughs> That's sort of a loaded question there. Um, and I wouldn't say it's one, one uh, missing piece. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a, a sort of a magical key that, that you kind of slot in and everything works. Um, I think there's a lot of gaps, a lot of areas where we can improve and need further uh, support in. Um, certainly you want to um, provide uh, the, the structural framework to make it easy for partnerships, for scaling. Um, and, and so that starts right from the very beginning. Uh, so as I mentioned, OBI played a very, very important role as a connector. And so if we can ensure that there are systems that allow for this, these connections to take place easier, faster, but also to support the growth of these partnerships, uh, that would be really, really um, helpful. Uh, our, you know, the, there's a the, there's a saying that Canada is the the land of pilots. Uh, everybody pilots up here, and then they take their business uh, down to the states to grow. So that sort of speaks to the environment itself and all the uh, the the challenges that um, neurotech startups uh, face. So it, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a loaded question. I'd really be interested to see what Andrea's perspective is, given that uh, she's right in the thick of it. Yeah, I, I think I'll just answer really quickly. Um, we, we haven't raised substantial funding, uh, <laughs> so we're, we're still learning as we go. But uh, one of the challenges that neurotechnology companies have anywhere is really building that efficacy base um, and and making sure that what you're doing um, works for the users, doesn't create additional harm, and that there is someone who can pay for it. You know, with um, neurotechnology anywhere or any product, really, you know, there needs to be someone who can pay for it. And when you're uh, working with people um, in the medical system, you know, very often it's expected that uh, that system would pay for it. And in Canada, that's really difficult. Um, in the US, uh, in order to get payers to fund it, you have to have a substantial base of uh, evidence and efficacy. And, and we're working on building that. Um, and of course, you need funding to get there and to do it. So it's not for a lack of um, interest from users. It's not for a lack of, uh, you know, companies and research. It's really just sometimes, um, you know, you just have to keep uh, persevering when things get difficult and um, and continuing to convince um, everyone that uh, what you're doing is important and that there is um, you know you yeah that you just have to to keep going and and uh, and continue to to gather the evidence and gather the data to show that um, that this is a company that will create substantial impact, but also um, in terms of scaling and getting that growth, you know, substantial returns for the investors. Thank you. So I, I, I see questions are trickling in here and, and we will save some time towards the end to get to as many as we can. But I, I want to now refocus to uh, how has this watch uh, impacted users, uh, what does it look like in practice? So Angel, um, what impact did you see this technology have for residents and 
is there maybe a salient story that sticks out to you? Yes, absolutely. We've had many wonderful experiences with uh, the Anxiety Watch here with Community Living North Bay. However, there is one um, one experience that I would particularly enjoy talking about this evening. And um, it was a young lady that was um, moving into one of our supported group living homes. And uh, she was moving in during a time of transition for herself. She was going from living with family into her own home, and it's something that she wanted. Um, however, with any move, there's uh, things that we need to learn about ourselves. And, you know, this young lady in particular had to learn um, the home, the environment, uh, her housemates and the staffing team who would travel this journey with her. And so um, we were really excited because things lined up perfectly in that sense. We became we began tra transitioning the young lady in about October. Um, and we began working with Awake Labs with the Anxiety Watch in approximately December. And so we decided that she would be a wonderful candidate um, to trial this technology with if you know she was uh, so inclined to do so. So we had a conversation with her and her support team about that and what it would look like. And, you know, she was really eager to participate in it. It was really um, a wonderful experience. Um, so essentially, what the Anxiety Watch helped us with, it, it really accelerated that transition period um, that we usually see when somebody moves into a new home. And um, it really helped us learn about her and uh, the supports that she required a lot faster. Um, in a very short time, we learned that this young lady had two preferred staff that she really, really enjoyed and um, that her anxiety would slightly go up when they weren't on shift or if she thought that they were on shift and in fact, maybe perhaps, um, you know, uh, traded a shift or, you know, was a sick call or something. Um, we learned that there were certain TV shows that came on that she disliked. She just did not like them. And um, it helped us piece the puzzle together as to why she was leaving the room. She would disengage. And we actually learned that to dive deeper into it, it wasn't even just the TV show. It was a certain character on the TV show that she did not care for. Um, so it was anomaly, like it was experiences like that that really um, helped us learn and grow and build those relationships. You know, for example, we learned that she quickly became accustomed to her new environment and the sounds of um, her roommates in a, a busy home and that she really did not like unexpected sounds. And so we were able to modify our approaches when it came to using loud appliances or um, practicing fire drills. We were able to pre-plan those with her and engage her in conversation so that she was expecting it, but she was successful in those scenarios. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, you know, Diane, you 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 mentioned similar success um, with Jessica in terms of uh, her wearing the Wake Labs technology, um, and in fact, you were immediately excited to have Jessica try it. And something that really stuck out to me in our conversation uh, was that you explained that this technology was like adding another tool in Jessica's toolbox to manage her anxiety. Can you tell us what you mean by that and why this device was a positive experience for Jessica? I absolutely, absolutely was so excited when I heard about this technology. And right away, I knew that this could be a part of, of helping Jess. Um, I've been a teacher for a long time, and part of my journey there has been to use technologies to help st all kinds of students have success. But I'd never found anything that worked for nonverbal people like Jessica. Um, so. We started using the watch in September and what it began to do is teach us when her anxiety started to rise. That, that was, it was often real news to us because we knew what she looked like when she was exploding and was uncomfortable. 
But sometimes when she looked quite relaxed, she would be sitting there and internally she was beginning to feel anxious or fearful. And the watch told us that. And that meant that staff or family could monitor and then intervene. Now, maybe we'll take a picture at Jess, uh, picture up of Jess right now, because really this is so much about a person-centered approach. This is part of a toolbox. It's not a panacea. It is not going to solve all of the problems. But what it will do is it will add to the, the many different things that we can do to help an individual succeed. In Jessie's case, we've had wonderful staff and certainly her family uh, know what calms Jessie and what, what makes her able to um, participate uh, in community at, at more successful levels. Um, so we know that if she starts to escalate, um, you can put on some music, you can sing a song, you could rub her arm or rub her palm. Um, you might engage in some water play. This might be a good time to go to the washroom and just play in the sink for a bit. There are lots of things to do, but you have to know, Jesse, and you have to know what it is that is the calming factor. That's huge. Staff has worked really hard. Now they get an additional piece to plug into their techniques, and that is the watch tells them when Jessie is beginning to escalate before she explodes. And that's so important. Um, I, I know most of you probably are very familiar with exclu uh, inclusion diagrams, but I'm going to put one up anyway because really and truly, this anxiety watch has made all the difference and I think will it continue to create uh, much difference. A person who is excluded or is in a separation system has a very small world. Integration and inclusion provide for a much larger world and we all know that as we age our world becomes smaller. So we want to make sure that our young people have as broad and interesting and wide a life as possible. Jesse's anxiety was getting in the way of that. So using the watch, we could monitor, we could help her, and hopefully over time, she may even begin on her own to, to figure out how she's feeling and how she can self-calm. You know, that's an outside thinking, but at the very, very least, um, we'll be able to to help her trust the people around her that if something becomes fearful for her that there will be someone who will help her and intervene and that trust i hope will be reflected in the community where people will not be afraid of her exploding because they know she is well supported and the, techno the technology of the watch is going to help with that. Mm. And it seems like such a strength of this technology is that is in that it's a proactive rather than, um, you know, something that is an afterthought or a reaction to an event that's already happened. Um, thank you so much. Absolutely. Diane. Yeah. And Rakib, I was going to say, you know, once a person has has exploded and has gotten to the highest level in, of anxiety, it's really hard to pull them back. Mm -hmm. By being able to catch it early on, you have much more success and, and there is less aggression. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diane. And I want to turn to another user, a long-term user of Awake Labs technology who wants to share her experience. Now, Lita is a 24-year-old woman with an intellectual disability, and she dreams of one day living independently. Here is Lita in her own words. We'll pull up a video. Hi, my name is Lita. I'm 24 years old. I live in my supported home the community living Windsor. They thought I wanted to watch. My anxiety was extremely hard to cope with. I used my parents as a way to help me cope. But whenever they were there though, 
I quickly became upset. This would cause me to become very angry, yell and swear. Staff was not able to help me as, as they were not able to develop the relationship that I could trust. I was also hospitalized several times due to my anxiety. I had now been wearing the watch for two years. I now live semi-independently. My relationship with staff is much better. They are able to help me early on. This has helped me trust them and now I receive more accepting of their help. I call my parents the less and the conversations are more positive. If the teacher would like to monitor my own anxiety with the watch because one day I want to live independently. Rakeeb, I think you might be muted. I don't know if you can hear me. Rakeeb, if you can hear me, you're muted. It is uh, the saying of 2020 and 2021. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> so I, I was just saying that something that sticks out to me, and, and firstly, thank you, Lita, for sharing your experience. But something that sticks out to me is Lita highlights how this technology facilitated a healthy, trusting relationship with her care staff, better communication. Diane and Angel, you both highlight that in your experience, a crucial key to success with the technology is the expertise and feedback of care staff and family who know the wearer best and who can tailor this information to best suit their needs and ultimately empower them. Can you talk more about this partnership and how you approach care staff who may be hesitant about using the technology? Uh, Angel, we'll, we'll start with you. Yes, absolutely. Um, when we started using the Anxiety Watch here at Community Living, um, we had to recognize that we really needed to take the time to talk to the team that's going to support the person and the technology. And so the conversation really happened with um, who was identified as the person's primary support. And the reason that that was identified as our strongest link is because primarily they're working with the the person 40 hours a week. And so they have um, already a bit of a knowledge base there, but they also have um, the most time to spend with the person and be consistent with the observation. The primary support worker, um, when we engaged them, it was an exploratory conversation. It was conceptual and we built it from the ground up. And I think that that's really um, what helped establish the commitment and the investment between all people who are engaging in this trial with this anxiety watch for the person. And so the conversation had to be understood that when we were getting ready to um, have these conversations that we needed to be open with our feedback and our views of the technology and, and it had to be accepted whether it was positive or negative and it needed to all be relevant. It needed to be considered and evaluated respectfully. So I think that that's really what um, set a really positive engaging tone to engage the staff here at Community Living. Another thing that we had to do is we had to show them the tech itself. I'm sure the staff, um, thought that, you know, oh, Lord, what am, what are we getting ourselves into? And the tech, it's something that is small, it's in style, and it's easy to use. It's products that in our own lives, we, we use all the time. And so that took away a lot of the reservations that someone might have. If you're not a techie person, you might think that you're getting in over your head. And once we were able to show them, hey, this is what it looks like, that was another carrot. It was successful. We had to identify that the primary support staff would be the lead. 
they would be the lead with the person, with the communication, with conversations with the, the family, clinicians, and awake labs. Um, and we also had to have goals set and we had to have excellent communication so that our findings, our observations, our successes were progressive. Can I jump in there a little bit? Absolutely. Yes, jump away. You, you have made such amazing points. Um, but it, you're right. It's all about the buy-in of staff. And there, in addition to being honest and open, you have to be really patient. There are a number of staff who work with Jesse who simply will not use the watch. They, they don't understand it. They don't know what to do. They've been shown repeatedly, but they really aren't comfortable. And so they have just pushed it aside and, and made, um, and just not used it. We have other younger staff who are all over this thing, who find it a tremendous help and have been uh, wonderful at teaching new staff as they come in how to make this work for them. Um, unfortunately, our, our primary worker, our primary support is one of the people who is absolutely not in touch with the technology. She understands it, uh, to, but she's afraid of it. So I think that's just going to be a question of patience and time, not making people feel stupid or out of the loop, but, but allowing her the time that she needs to catch up with a technology that she's not familiar with. Thank you, Diane and Angel. So I'm going to ask for everyone to come back on the screen and, and we're going to start our Q&A portion. Um, there are a few questions here, and I'll just uh, direct it to one of you or, or maybe everyone uh, on the panel. So uh, one question we have from Phil or Phyllis, sorry. Um, does the watch know the baseline of the patient? And so I think this is going to be for um, Andrea. To com so does the watch know the baseline of the patient to compare to know when the user is stressed? Is that an app integrated with Samsung or could it be any other smartwatch? So first the baseline question and then um, I guess the, the type of watch that it could be paired with. Yeah, great questions. Um, we do at the very beginning um, of uh, when you put the watch on, we capture the baseline of that user during the day. Um, and then from the rest of the day, we're able to look at um, how their um, strong emotion levels or stress levels compare to that baseline. So we do have the baseline. Um, one of the, the learning curves is that um, the baseline right now is captured when you turn the watch uh, back on after it's been powered off. And so that needs to happen um, every time you put the watch on in the morning. Um, so if you haven't had a baseline in a few days and the readings aren't very accurate, so we're learning um, about that. And then um, to answer your second question, right now it is just the Samsung watches, but we are looking at, um, in partnership with Hall of Blurview, we're looking at exploring other watches as well to make it even more accessible. Great. Um, and actually following up for you, Andrea, um, we have C. Kondopali who asks, could Awake Labs elaborate on user privacy of data collected by the Anxiety Meter app? Absolutely. Um, privacy is a fundamental thing that in everything that we do, um, we don't share any user information. We follow all the privacy guidelines um, of of the, I guess, lands that we <laughs> operate in, um, whether it's Ontario, Canada, the US, et cetera. Um, the watch doesn't actually know anything about the user besides their heart rate. Uh, we use, um, you know, codes to connect the watch in the mobile phone and even through the dashboard. So we actually capture very little personal uh, health data and we store very little personal health data, but we have um, secure databases. And we're actually right now, um, working with the Office of the Privacy Commissioner to um, do a review of our of our databases um, through uh, to make sure that that we're all um, you know extra secure. But um, it is very important to what we do, and uh, and we make sure that um, you know it was it was designed from 
uh, the fundamentals um, up to where we are now. Great. Now, Randy asks, how does the Awake Labs Watch interact with the user? Do they do anything with it? What does it monitor? For example, Diane just talked about the watch telling them something. Um, so, I mean, D Diane, what does that interaction actually look like for you and Jessica with the Wake Labs? So again, it's really important that you know the person and that you had a full person-centered approach. The watch will read at high levels if she's very anxious, but also if she's very excited. So if she's singing and dancing, it will it will read high, but you can see from her behavior that she's not anxious, she's extremely happy. Um, where where we really like uh, like the the use of the watch is when we can see her anxiety when we can see the little ball on the rock on the watch move from normal to low level anxiety and if we can intervene at that time then she is apt to have really good success and to have um, no aggression and and no fe great fear. If it moves up to the middle stage, we can still bring it down. But uh, once it hits the high stage, uh, it's pretty evident all around that 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 this person is 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 in a stage of anxiety that that they can no longer cope. Andrew, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, uh, just build on uh, Diane's point really quickly. So um, the watch measures strong emotions like stress and anxiety, but also like fear, anger, or excitement. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, it really um, helps prompt that um, bias towards that you're you're missing something or there might be something else going on. Um, and as Diane said, sometimes you can tell uh, that it is happiness um, and excitement. Um, and then other times, you know, you you might be able to um, do some prompts and, and really figure out more what's going on. Um, the watch itself uh, just shows um, the time and the date um, and the battery level. And then um, it communicates over Wi-Fi to the app on the um, on the smartwatch or sorry, on the mobile device. And that is where you see all the readings and where you get um, notifications from. Um, from the watch and uh, and you're able to do those prompts. So the ball that Diane mentioned here um, scrolls up uh, the screen and is able to show um, what your anxiety levels are. So that was my anxiety reading from about 30 minutes ago. It's up in the medium, <laughs> um, but we'll say that that's excitement for right now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of our viewers, Lisa, um, asks, I'm wondering if once anxiety is identified for the wearer, could a smartphone or a device be prompted to cue the wearer to use strategies to reduce anxiety or play a certain song or guided meditation? So firstly, Angel, do you think that that would be a, a great addition to this device? Absolutely. And um, I've let Andrea know that I'm very much interested into moving into that area once we're there. I see a lot of potential there. We have another question from Darlene who asks, I would love to know more about how we can add FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, to the conversation. It is 2.5 times oh. more prevalent than autism and yet receives very little support and understanding, especially in our province. Yep. Um, does anyone want to tackle that question? Uh, I, 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 think, think, um, I can start if, with that. Okay, okay go ahead, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that's a really, really good point. Um, the, the, the technology was uh, originated because of our conversations with uh, families and clients at Hall and Bloor View. Um, and and um, the lar a large population of that group is uh, our people with uh, ASD. But certainly um, we recognize that there's a lot of other applications for this, a lot of other populations that can benefit from this. And so we are actually going to be um, conducting some uh, other studies uh, in the pediatric field 
that will not necessarily be limited to um, children with uh, ASD, but uh, other conditions that um, that uh, where the patients uh, experience high levels of anxiety. So, and Andrea, I'll, I'll that, pass we... it to you. Thanks. Um, we uh, we currently Awake Labs, we work with adults with uh, all intellectual and developmental disabilities. So some of our users um, do have a diagnosis of um, FASD as well. Um, we are uh, working on, um, you know, building that uh, user base and, and awareness across the board. Um, and we're not limited to autism at all. Um, and as as the, uh, the uh, question um, stated, you know, that there are many uh, similarities um, and there's a huge population that is that is often um, overlooked, um, even more so than um, than uh, the population we're working with now. So uh, we are working with uh, clinicians across Ontario um, to to address some of the groups that we're missing. Thank you. Um, and our last question will be from Debbie. Um, Debbie says they're watching from Stansted in the United Kingdom. My gosh, it's quite late it's in the United Kingdom. Okay, thank you for, for tuning in, Debbie. Uh, is this technology available to clients overseas or just in Canada and America at the present? Um, it's available uh, uh, through, <laughs> through our website right now. Um, and, uh, and you're welcome to reach out to us directly um, and uh, we can definitely talk about it um, and, and to make sure uh, we can get you a watch. We actually just sent um, uh, a watch over to the Netherlands. Um, so uh, we are expanding internationally. Great, and that actually leads me uh, to one of my final questions here is, uh, as you mentioned, Andrea, you're expanding. And so since March of 2020, I think, you mentioned over 220 individuals with autism or intellectual disability have received Awake Labs technology in community care homes alone. So what needs to happen to make sure this technology is accessible to anyone who can benefit from it? And you know, how could maybe the public or people listening help? Um, we can start off with you, Andrea. Thank you. Um, it's such a great question. And as I mentioned um, a little bit earlier, the question about neurotech, you know, building that evidence base and um, and really uh, showing the impact of the technology is critical in order to make it accessible for everyone. Not everyone can um, afford uh, the smartwatch or the technology themselves. Um, and so making sure that we can get it funded by the province or um, different types of payers um, to make it accessible to people. But we need that base of uh, research and evidence to show the efficacy. And of course, stories um, and sharing uh, the evidence uh, from Angel and from Diane and Lita really helped. Um, but we right now have two uh, ethics approved studies, one at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in uh, Toronto and one through the National Research Council. And um, both are, are starting to build up that data set um, from third parties to show that this technology um, is uh, effective and can improve quality of life and can build more uh, trusting relationships. And really what they're looking for is that it helps decrease the cost of uh, care and help people um, you know, live fuller, um, more and really enjoy their lives more so um so that's what we're working on now is is uh building that evidence base um if you want to participate in those research studies um and you're based in ontario we would love to have you join and again i apologize to our friends in the uk but if you're based in ontario we do have a couple of uh, watches and free licenses that we have to give away and you're welcome to email us at hello at awakelabs.com and if you do receive uh, the watch and the license, um, you're welcome to participate and join in those studies through CAMH or through uh, the National Research Council. We would love to have you and welcome you on board. Thank you. And we'll have those resources available for those who want them. Sharon, do you have anything to add? I mean, this is a fantastic model of research to impact. Um, is there anything that you wanna add on to um, what Andrea just said? 
Yeah, I think, I mean, I think Andrea did and Awake Labs did an incredible job. Um, and I think part of that success has been the engagement uh, with families and, and patients. And this is something that I, I truly believe needs to be incorporated into every step uh, from, from the start of a research project right through to um, you know getting real world feedback right through to advocacy to have something like this um, be reimbursed or or put on a, a, a third party player payer plan um, at holland bloorview we uh, ensure that uh, families are engaged right from the get-go um, right from you know uh, a grant application. We don't even start grant. Uh, we don't even start research unless we get the approval of families, and so um, this is where I think uh, Awake Labs has really excelled in, in in ensuring that they've involved the families and all stakeholders uh, for, right from the beginning. Thank you. We are running a few minutes behind schedule, but. I do want to end by giving our wonderful panelists the last word. Um, so if there's any message you want to convey for those tuning in, um, in a nutshell, uh, Diane, we'll, we'll start with you. I'm really excited about the watch and I'm also excited by what may come from this research. I, I have, I have a strong feeling that, uh, that bigger things will grow from this. And I see something that's really hopeful for my daughter and for our family so that, you know, she can be successful. Thank you, Diane. Angel? Yeah, I um, started on this journey with Awake Labs as an interest and it quickly became a passion. It's been a wonderful journey to um, travel with Awake Labs. And I want to reiterate how responsive and supportive the company has been with us. Um, it's been inspiring for us at Community Living because we really get to provide those early interventions to people. And it takes less time to de-escalate people and to do debriefings. And it gives us the opportunity to put more investment into doing things that are so much fun and growth building with the person who is using the watch. You know, you can go from um, de-escalations to learning how to cook in the kitchen. I mean, come on, that's wonderful. Mm. Thank you so much, Angel. Um, pass it on to you, uh, Sharon. Yeah, I, I mean, I have to say, listening to the conversation today really um, validates my job, why I've been even here doing what I'm doing. Uh, commercialization at Hall & Bloor View is, is really a means to, the end, to an end. Um, it's a way to employ business strategy, to leverage partnerships, uh, to to drive these uh, innovations out be beyond our four walls at the hospital, at the Research Institute, uh, and to see uh, Awake Labs and all, all the, the amazing stakeholders and the partners here um, bring this to life is really, really rewarding. And, and that's why we're doing it. Hmm. Thank you. And last but not least, Andrea. Well, oh, um, I mean, I'm so grateful to our incredible partners who are here on the panel. Thank you so much for sharing your stories and your kind words. Um, you know, we really truly uh, exist to help people um, manage their stress and anxiety so they can enjoy their lives more. Um, as I mentioned, we right now work with adults uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So if you are a self-advocate or you know someone um, who who could benefit from this technology, please, please email us. We do have a couple of watches to give away. Um, hello at Awake Labs is the email. And if you think that this technology might be useful for um, any other area that we haven't talked about today, uh, we are also um, uh, like uh, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, we would love to um, talk to you more about that in those use cases and partner with you to um, help 
uh, you know, create that impact in your community as well. So please, please reach out to us. Well, I just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your insights and your lived experience. And I hope this sparks more conversation outside of this chat and more collaborations. And thank you so much again. Um, cheers to everyone who is tuned in uh, and who uh, is interested in being part of this conversation. Uh, we have some resources to share with you for more information around this topic. We'll post them on the screen shortly. Uh, they're also available on the OBI website under the talk description here on the live stream page. Um, so once again, thank you everyone and uh, take care.